Welcome to Winners Wallets and Worldviews, the only show that's gonna teach you how to be somebody. Where in your life did you learn that you're not good? Take what you're most passionate about and what you're most fearful of. And what is the plan to overcome that fear? And what is the plan to enact that passion? Welcome to Winners Wallets and Worldviews. I'm your host, AJ Armstrong. Today with me, I have Lane Kowoka on the on the show, and Lane is is got a fascinating story. But before I get into that, I want to share with you guys really quickly this program that Marissa and I are really excited to launch with everybody. So we were looking, and I'm talking about Marissa and I, the longest time for some type of seminar that's in a beautiful vacation destination, involves some kind of adventure but also gets you business insight and personal growth and development experiences while still enjoying the location. So we kind of saw two sides of the spectrum as we tried to investigate this. We we saw you could go to vacation destinations, but there really wasn't any growth and development. There wasn't any kind of business development. There wasn't anything impactful as I'd go to these locations. And on the flip side of that, I'd go to seminars and they were in cool places, but it was so much work, there wasn't enough time to enjoy it. So we wanted to create something called Personal Growth Ventures, and that's personalgrowthventures.com. And it's something where we're going to have a a retreat in May of 2020, and it's going to be on the island of St. Lucia. We're really excited about it because we've created not only business, not only personal growth and development, and not only adventures, but it's also going to give you guys something called ROI, return on your investment. This thing is guaranteed to start to figure out what is the weakness within your business or what are the strengths within your business and how do we capitalize on them. So number one thing, the number one reason that small businesses fail, that startups fail, is they don't have a clear cut of the market share. They don't have a real good marketing plan. What that is, that's your unique value prop. If you guys don't have a unique value prop that's super compelling and usually something that's extremely convincing to the market, you're not going to get that shut. You're not going to get a cut of that market piece, and that's what I start seeing all the struggles with these small businesses is they don't have that. So I want to do something that I've created this program. It's called the Two Day MBA, and it's not a real Master's in Business Administration, but I've consolidated really the stuff that matters in an MBA program into two days, and it's about six course hours of work. And throughout those course hours, I want to go over your UVP. I want to work with your individual business plans. And even if you don't have a business, this can work on your life. These same exact applications work with my personal one-on-one clients as well. And I want to apply those into your business or into your life to figure out what are your strengths, what are your weaknesses, what are your passions, and what is the market truly valuing? How can you start doing these market studies? How do you start to test out if the market's really working? So the two-day MBA is going to be one of several courses that we're going to be doing on the Personal Growth Ventures Retreat. But that's one of the number one reasons that businesses fail. And I want to make sure that I give you guys no reason to either, if you want to start a business, go try something, or two, if you've got a business, to actually create steady steady cash flow and then create scalability. And that's the second piece. If you guys don't know what your business model looks like, and there's not a way to scale this, and you don't have a good system in place, you're eventually going to end up becoming just a business operator instead of a business owner. And I want to get you guys from being a business operator into being a business owner. So on this show today with Lane, we talk about building passive income. And you guys are going to be able to start to do this with your business. And we talk about real estate a lot more. But I just wanted to share with you that this is an adventure of a lifetime. So you guys are going on excursions. You guys are also going to be going to a beautiful island destination with tons of downtime. But you're also going to be getting valuable insights in business and in your life. So I wanted to share that opportunity with you. If you guys go to personalgrowthventures.com and you register right now with this podcast, you can get on our early bird discount, which includes a free massage from the hotel, as well as branding photography with your business. And if you guys are coming just like, hey, I'm not, I don't have a business, I want to learn something, you can also use that uh, photography for your own personal leisure. So with that said, guys, I have Lane Kawaka coming on the show. He's a licensed professional engineer. And he's got a master's degree in civil engineering with an emphasis in construction management and a bachelor's in industrial engineering from the University of Washington. As an engineer, Lane has managed over $230 million of capital construction projects in both the public, state, federal, and private sector. Aside from his day job, he controls two manufactured home parks, 15 apartment buildings, and one assisted living facility totaling in 2,600 units in the U.S. markets. 
And Elaine's project, simplepassivecashflow.com, is a free podcast and online learning resource where he talks about passive real estate investing, mostly for the W-2 employee. Working as a high-paid professional in corporate America and frustrated by the traditional wealth building dogma, Lane was compelled to inspire and mentor other working professionals on how to do real estate investing and build their own portfolios. Lane urges other working professionals, just as just getting started by utilizing their high and best use day jobs to save the 20% down payment for their conventional loan to acquire single family home rentals. Simple passive cash flow method, excuse me, simple passive, passive cash flow method, I can't talk today, it's late right now guys, <laughs> is the only method that he insists to buy investments with healthy cash flow buffer so you can withstand a market downturn. Guys, he has gotten so much publicity. He's been featured on multiple different media sources. He's all over social media, and he was a blast to talk to. I really enjoyed his unique perspective on real estate investing, especially because we always talk about some of you guys like that side hustle. So one of our most number one downloaded podcasts was how can we create a real side hustle? So I wanted to give you guys some tactical strategies on how to build wealth by talking to Lane, and I think you guys are going to get that from this conversation. So I was it was a blast having him on. I'm really excited for you guys to listen, so sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Welcome to Winners Wallets and World Views, everybody. My name is AJ Armstrong, your host. We talk about investing, talk about winning in your life. We also talk about enlightening your perspective. So today I'm really excited to have Lane Kawaoka, and I hope I didn't butcher the last name too much, but he's really been an expert out there, guys, in passive real estate investing, building your portfolio. But what's interesting about his method is he does it with a corporate mindset and having a W-2 job or being able to still have your day job and build wealth financially. So I'm really excited to have you on, Lane. Thanks a lot for coming, man. Hey, thanks for having me, Aaron. Yeah, man. Well, let's roll into it. So like just on the pre-show, we talked a little bit about, you know, some of your background, where you came from. So I'm just kind of curious on what got you started in your journey? Kind of what, what, what was your life, you know, your upbringing, your childhood, and what got you into passive investing and figuring out that you didn't want to do this thing full time, but you still had a different way of approaching wealth? Yeah, so I, um, I'm kind of like any other guy out there who I call it the linear path. Parents told me to study hard. Yeah go to college. Um, I went to college, got an engineering degree. And then I went to work for the man as a construction supervisor. So if anybody's in the construction world, you know, your first five years basically suck a lot. <laughs> You're traveling around from job to job. Um, I supervise a bunch of old men who are like my grandpa's age. Um, just a bunch of whiny babies. Yeah. So, so to say, I, I didn't really care for my job. So what, so when, when did you start to like, so let's just go back to school. So you studied engineering because you were interested in it, right? And then you kind of moved into the career and you're like, this isn't exactly what I'm cut out to do. Yeah, I don't know. If, or was it just like you felt like you were obligated to be an yeah, engineer? Yeah, I mean, I was decent at math, right? So everybody <laughs> kind of pushed it. Oh, you should be an engineer, right? Yeah. And, and the nice thing about engineers, you get paid a pretty decent salary after undergraduate. You don't need yep. to go all this like extra schooling to get paid even more. Yeah, which frees up that cash so you can start to do stuff with it, which I imagine we're going to talk about here in a little bit because, you know, I'm an engineering undergrad as well. Systems engineering, a little different than construction, but that was one of the things that helped me get into real estate was just like perfect credit score, high paying job. You can get loans, you can get whatever you need. You have cash to invest. So that was helpful in that regard. But yeah. I mean, I was, back actually, to your story. I was actually like an industrial engineer. So, I mean, those oh, guys really? live in in all these like queuing formulas and oh yeah yeah that's my that's my that's my forte man yeah i was never really into all that kind of stuff i would be the kid who would basically broker all the the answers for the homeworks um, <laughs> amongst all the groups because i just couldn't do I, it like i mean <laughs> see i thought systems engineering was like the easiest engineering degree to get so that's why I just went with it. I'm like, it's yeah. engineering, you know? <laughs> like, but yeah, me too. That's why I did it. I mean, my school had like material science and engineering and paper science, which were easier, but yeah, I couldn't get into civil, mechanical, computer, or electrical. So yeah, we're, we're just nerding out hard over here. This is good stuff. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I wasn't a very good engineer. That's, that's the long, that's the short of the story. And I went to project management in a okay. construction setting. Because I couldn't really design anything to save my life. <laughs> so you were more of like a leader in a way then. You were like, there was the people side of things or it was just. Like... I, I guess so. I mean, but it's probably more that I, I wasn't good at the other stuff, right? <laughs> <laughs> so it's more, more by default, you get pushed into project management. Right, right. You know, project managers, you don't really need to know much about anything. You just have to like, 
stay on top of people and just yeah, bug hey, them. Dude, right? get your stuff done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm with you, man. I'm a pretty bad engineer myself, so. Yeah. So um, as he's saying, you know, like engineers, they get paid pretty decent. I, I think I got paid like 80 grand out of college. Yeah. And I, you know, again, I'm just following all the financial dogma out there, which is going, the next step is to go buy a house to live in. Oh yeah. So I was living in Seattle. I saved up to buy a, my first um, house that I was going to live in in a couple of years, you know, cause I, they, at that time I was like super frugal, eating ramen, doing all this ridiculous stuff. I have, on my website, I have this like page of all this, these funny things I would do to save money. Like, um, I don't know. I, I can't really think of them right now because it's so long ago. But um, yeah, yeah. simplepassivecashflow.com slash cheapo is that list. But um, <laughs> That's so like yeah. my wife and I, when, when we were in the military, it was the same thing. Like save up as much because I was like that, you know, following that Dave Ramsey kind of stuff where it's like all that's bad. Just save up as much cash as you can and help me. But it was like we, we were married having roommates, you know, I mean, it's like that's just how we how much we were like and that obviously didn't go over as well but so we got out of that but i, I feel you man just getting that initial cash up front was so huge for us but yeah right right like i get it like you know you you have to be frugal and to save up some capital but you know it can only take you so far yeah and, you can only you can't save your way into wealth per se exactly you know? exactly so i i bought this house to live in it was like an a-class rental in seattle and um you know it we'll kind of go over some basics and you, you, you wanted to kind of give your folks some tangible stuff. So yeah, let's go over the basics for everybody who may be interested in jumping into real estate someday. It doesn't know the details yet. Yeah. So a class rentals are like your luxury stuff. It's new builds probably built in the, you know, two thousands or later, you know, these don't aren't really the greatest investments in my opinion. I agree. Um, I go after cash flow investments that yep. and those are more of the B and C class. So, B class are more, you know, like 1990s, 1980s property. Um, you know, it's a little bit less, a little cheaper, a little bit more value, I would say. Um, white collar, blue collar mix. Yep. Class C or like a little older, 1960s, 1970s properties. Definitely have a lot of um, harder tenants, you know, a lot of single mothers in that area. And then there's class D and F that I just categorize as war zone properties. <laughs> so, yeah, you, you don't want to be in the A class because you're not going to be able to find the rent to value ratios. We'll, we'll talk about it a little bit later, but um, and then you don't want to be in the war zone properties because your tenants will just like shoot you up and when you try and collect the rent. Yeah. yeah, and if you guys are landlords, you know what this is like. I mean, I'm telling you, I had a geez, I had a tenant. It was like eight months of rent he didn't pay. We had to get him out. This is a you probably one of your war zone units. I could tell stories all day about this stuff, but one lady was like shooting heroin in one of the units and then didn't pay rent for a few weeks. And we're like, why? And she, cause she just passed out on the ground for like a few days. And we're like, okay, this is, this is a situation we need to figure out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, eight I've, got, eight I've got some stories, but I mean, I'll be honest with you, man. Like I just hire a professional property manager and they do all that garbage work for me. Oh yeah. That, I learned that really fast. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I know that's probably the first thing people are thinking is like, Oh, I don't want to deal with temp tenants. Well, I don't really deal with tenants, you know, like I, I honestly don't really know how to do an ev eviction. Right? <laughs> I mean, they're different in every city or county or whatever. The property management does that. That's why you pay them 10% of the rents. Yeah. And what do you have to say to all those people then the like, you know, the, the cheap landlords out there like, oh, I want that 10%. I don't, I don't believe in hiring a property manager. You got to be hands on. You got to know your properties. What do you say to those dudes? Because I, mean, I agree you with got, you. You got to be an uh, investor, not a landlord. Mm. I mean, I, I mean Look, I have 2,600 units doing a different way of doing it. Um, most landlords out there, I would say 90% of them are investing in the wrong stuff, more A-class rentals for appreciation in primary markets, not secondary and tertiary markets. And they're doing it all themselves. And when you're doing it all yourself, you know, you have limited bandwidth and you're not able to go find other deals and build other relationships with other passive investors to find those deals. Yeah. So. I mean, I think there's a, there's a statistic out there by Fannie Mae Freddie Mac who basically we always go to Fannie Mae Freddie Mac for our, our government subsidized loans for these properties. And there was like some kind of statistic where they took all the data from the, basically all the, the, the small mom and pa landlords, you know, all these single non-owner occupied properties. And they realized like 90% 90, 90 of them only owned like one property. Mm -hmm. So that tells me 90% of people are doing it wrong because there's no reason why you should only have one rental 
I mean, yeah. I, it took me probably about five, seven years to get up to 10. You know, if you're doing it the right way, you should be able to scale pretty quickly and get the financial independence. But it's the guy who is hoarding equity in their property and just kind of living, um, you know, not optimizing their equity is yeah. doing it wrong. Yeah, one of my buddies just picked up at a sheriff sale. It was like 34 units or something. And over in our area, that was, I think he said he paid like 300,000 for it. It appraises over a million. So it's like, you're looking at a deal he paid, he just got within an afternoon, $700,000 of equity added right onto his net worth. So it's just kind of like, you know, those, those ideas are out there if you have the time to look for them. So right. Cool. Right. Let's get back to your story. So you're in, you're in project management now. Yeah. So I, um, I had that house that I lived in for a year and you know, you got to think this is like a young 23 year old kid. Um, I was never home cause I was traveling all the time. So I was like, well, why don't I just try and rent this thing out? Let me call up an old uh, property manager or landlord that I had. And let me just have a quick conversation and say, Hey, can you like rent my property out when I just go live on the company dime in hotels um, so we did that and I, we got it rented out, uh, 2,200 a month. My mortgage was 1,600 a month. And for, yeah. you know, that's a lot of beer money. That was like a few hundred bucks at least <laughs> every month. Um, I didn't know anything about like the 50% rule or primary, secondary, tertiary markets or the class A, B and C stuff. I just knew I was making money and I was like, damn it. Like I got to do this again. I got you know, to get myself out of this rat race, you know, again, of a job that I didn't really like. Yeah. So yeah, you know, just started listening to podcasts and um, kind of learn. What, about what podcast did you start to gravitate to just out of curiosity? Um, I don't know. I mean, you just start binging on dozens and dozens of podcasts, right? And yeah. you just start to learn the stuff slowly. Yeah. Yeah. This is a, uh, so you're starting to feel that, that little, side hustle income that wake up in the morning money that we always talk about, you know, it's like, damn, here we go. $1,600 mortgage getting paid for by other people like legit. Right. Right. And you know, I don't do any of this stuff where I mail yellow letters or wholesaling or like, you know, kind of what your, your friend did make yeah. these huge jumps. I mean, I, nothing I do is special. I just go out and buy turnkey properties that, you know, they're, the numbers. Where do you find, where do you find your deals then? So you just go right off the MLS with an agent and just try to find your deals or how do you? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, initially I, I worked with these like turnkey providers, these like flippers that would rehab the house for you, put new appliances, new flooring, electrical, plumbing, et cetera. Yeah. But then I just found my own broker after that, once I kind of knew what I was looking for. And you know, the, the prototype was find like a hundred thousand dollar house. That's in a B, a C class, um, kind of building in a little bit better area B area and the rents will typically be about a thousand dollars a month and then you know rinse wash repeat get another one yeah yeah that's the way to do it man yeah so there was nothing special about what you were finding it's just kind of building the, that network and connections because i mean i i know dudes that just swear by you know sending out mailers getting lead generation machines to dump you know all this exorbitant amount of data in your face to where you can start to pick up you know, court documents and obituaries and you name it to find deals. But you're saying it's really not that difficult. It's like just knowing exactly what you're looking for and being able to kind of pick the deal. Yeah. I mean, you can do that stuff, but you know, like my, my thing, like my platforms, I work with like doctors, dentists, engineers, accountants, at some point it makes more sense for people to spend more time at their day job, you know, even though that's what we don't like. Yeah. Um, than to go screw around with all these other means and methods um, in a much more competitive environment, you know, to find yeah. these de-stressed houses and spend the time and take on the extra risk. So yeah. I'm a proponent for like just saving up the 20% down payment and then just buying another property retail price pretty much. And okay. Doing it again and again and again. Okay. So you just did getting a taste of real estate at this point in your life. You know, you got the single family that it's a single family unit. Yeah. Yeah. It was an A class area. And then, then the next one I picked up was more of a B plus area. Okay. A little bit better rent to value ratio. And maybe I'll kind of go over that. So the rent to value ratio is something, you know, it's a super quick and dirty way of seeing if you're going to cash flow and to compare rentals against each other. So what you do is you take the monthly rent divided by the purchase price. 
So for example, $1,000 a month rent divided by $100,000 house is at 1%. And you're trying to look for something that's higher than 1% mm -hmm. value ratio. Um, a lot of places in, so that property in Seattle at the time, I bought for 350 and it rented for 2200. Obviously that's less than 1%. And yeah. I realized that a couple of years in, I was like, oh crap, this, these aren't good numbers. You know, Where can I find these 1% properties or more? And that was kind of where I transitioned to find properties in Birmingham, Atlanta, and Indianapolis. So you'll just buy any, so you'll buy any deal that's within that C plus B minus range. That's at a 1% rule. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, of course I built up a team of like property managers to kind of vet the deal, the location for me. Cause I just don't want to buy the house next to the crack house. Um, oh yeah. But yeah. I mean, pretty simple, right? That's why simple. You, you don't, you don't want to buy them next to my properties, man. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, everybody has a different um, investment philosophy, right? Mine's was, look, I'm just going to go back to my job making 80, 100K a year, kiss butt there, and um, save up the money to buy these properties quicker. Um, I, I thought that was better use of my time. Yeah. Okay. So now you're starting to get into the, you're starting to get into the game. So when did you decide you wanted to like not, you like, tell me about the decision process between I want to stick with my job and make money here versus what if I just went and scoured the market for deals and all this stuff? Like how did you kind of determine if the ROI was greater to just kind of keep your W2 going? Uh, I just saw like so much competition, right? I mean, there's a real estate investor born every day. I mean, for, I just kind of took a look, a good self-awareness check of myself. And then, you know, I don't know if you guys follow like Gary Vaynerchuk, but that's a big thing of his is self-awareness. Yeah. Like for me, like what, how was I different from most people? Well, I had a pretty good salary, right? It wasn't amazing. It's not like a doctor's salary, but it's pretty decent. So I just was kind of just thinking with my skill set or my situation, how can I best leverage that? What sets me apart from everybody else? And most people don't have, don't make more than 60 grand a year. And those people have to do things like stand on the court steps, uh, mail yellow letters, get on the phone, bang out calls, do that wholesaling stuff. And I just, you know, you always want to be cognizant of what, what most people are doing and do a little bit different. So it's a way like you're using your strengths, really. Right, like, right. Align it with your strengths. Exactly. Yeah, I think that's huge, too, because like when you focus in on those strengths like that, and then it's also where is the cash flow coming at the moment? And it's like if I focus here for a while, while in the background, I got this portfolio of real estate just kind of kicking around some cash. You know, it's like now we have a two pronged approach at building wealth. We've got two streams of cash flow. If your properties are cash flowing, which by your analysis, most of the time they probably will, you know, if you're picking those kinds of properties and then you've got this major income stream coming in. So it's like, I wanted to say that too, because I, I know like in this space where I like coach and work with a lot of entrepreneurs, um, there's like a huge advantage to people that also have high paying jobs that might enjoy it. Like you can still build wealth quickly. It's, it's cash flow. It's coming in, it's coming at you. Like this is good stuff. And that's why I like having you on. It's cause like, yeah, you can keep your job guys. If you like it, if you're a nurse, a doctor, a professional, an engineer, whatever it is, there's other ways you can dance in the entrepreneur space and still like build wealth. And that's why I love this, you know? Right. Right. I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to tell you this engineering term, the Senki diagram, if you ever heard of this thing, no, you know, there's a website out there. You can make your own Sinky diagram, but what it does is it graphically outlines your incomes and expenses in a super cool way. And, you know, I tell a lot of my guys like, Hey, like, this is how you explain this to your family who doesn't understand what the heck they're doing. <laughs> and so, you know, it, in the first year you buy a rental, year three, you buy another rental. Um, this is, you know, for people who are able to save more than, 20 or 30 grand a year. Um, some of my guys can save like 30 grand a year. So maybe they're buying two rentals every year. Yeah. But you know, every rental you buy, you're, you're adding just a small incremental increase to your monthly cash flow, probably about $300. Mm -hmm. um, it's small, but it adds up and it starts to compound over, you know, a short period of time, maybe like five years. And this is what I kind of did. Um, you know, of course, engineer make a spreadsheet but, or you can make a Senki diagram, like I'm saying, but <laughs> you, you start to realize like after five or 10 years, you're in an entirely different place financially. And you can see the light at the end of the tunnel. Well, I can, you know, most of my guys, they can quit their job in five to 10 years Yeah, you know, with, a un, with about a, under a hundred thousand dollars salary at their day job. And when I realized that I was like, well, 
this job's not too bad. You know, <laughs> I can keep doing this for a little bit longer, maybe not 30 years, but definitely five or 10. What gives you power at least, right? Like you can make those decisions that if I'm not enjoying it at any point, I can do something else or leave. But if you're stressed by the financial need of having that relying on that income, it makes quitting or leaving or doing something you're passionate about much more difficult. Right, right. And you know, like something that's interesting that I saw once I sort of became unemployable and got down the road of, you know, a few rentals and saw I was definitely on the path to financial freedom is like you start to see at your day job, you know, you're working, especially like the managers, you know, they're, they're not there because they're great people. They're there because they wanted that little extra bump in salary because their life commanded it. And mm-hmm. most people are at that workplace because that's what they have to do. And they're going to choose their families over the, uh, the loyalty of their coworkers or people who work under them is what I realized. Uh, maybe I just worked in a bad company, but that's just what I, I that was like the, uh, the belief system that I adopted. Sure. So, so it's kind of like the culture and stuff that you fell into was more of driven by kind of the selfish nature of providing for the immediate people surrounding me versus following something in alignment with purpose and passion, like you might see in a more positive culture or something that's more aligned with you and your purpose. So right. that, make, that makes sense. And it's just kind of like, why would I want to be, you know, just trying to chase that extra bogey when I can do other things with my time to create something to create, to offset that extra income that I'd be expecting. Right. So about five, uh, yeah, seven years into working for a private company, getting that higher salary, I transitioned to more government sector jobs that were a little okay. more chill paid a little bit less but you know hey i did I, I didn't really need the money you know i just needed the health insurance at that time sure so you're looking for jobs that are just kind of like um something you're comfortable with because you value your time and just talking to you it sounds like you just really value you know your time and your energy a lot more in that when you're selecting that single source of income that w2 income Right. And that, and that changes over time, right? It's not a maturity thing. It's just quite frankly, how much passive income do you have? Yeah. I mean, when, when I crossed the threshold of a few rentals, probably about four of them, and I was bringing in at least a thousand dollars passive income a month, that was when that was sort of the tipping point. I can say that I switched from doing all these stupid things and to <laughs> save money and start to value my time more and start being more conscious, you know, choosing what I wanted to do because I knew I wasn't there yet by any means, but I was on definitely on the way to financial freedom. Yeah. So how many years did it take you to build up 2,600 units? So the first 11 was the, well, it took the longer. So that, I think I hit there in 2015, okay. 2016. Um, but then there was a little bit of a turning point. I realized that, you know, single family homes, they're great. They cash flow a few hundred bucks every month. But, you know, I had 11 of them and that was only 3000 a month. That's not enough for you to quit your day job by any stretch of the imagination. Right. And with that sample size, I had about an eviction or two every quarter or every, you know, every year and a big catastrophe that happened every quarter, which is no problem, right? Again, we're hiring property management to take care of all that stuff. But you know, if, if most people will say that they need about $10,000 passive income to be able to quit their job. And that means I would have needed like 30 of these single family homes. Now mm-hmm. you're talking about an eviction every other month and a big catastrophe every few weeks. And that's just not scalable. Right. So I, I started to learn more about like multifamily apartments. And, you know, at that point I paid $30,000 for a mentor to teach me how to analyze those deals and to find those deals. And um, I did that for a couple of years. And then, um, you know, because I was living in Seattle, which is nowhere near the secondary tertiary markets like Texas or Georgia or, you know, a lot of those Southern um, states, I wasn't able to get in cahoots with the brokers, which is a big thing. Um, And at the same time, I learned about real estate syndication and I just sort of became a limited partner in a lot of these small, these bigger deals. And I realized that those returns were enough for me to hit my financial independence goals because especially the tax benefits are a lot better than the single family homes. And then, you know, it's a lot, lot less work. 
So explain, explain to everybody what a limited partner is and a bigger deal and a syndication deal, what that looks like and how yeah, you so, handle them. So a real estate syndication the analogy we like to use is like an airplane. So in the cockpit, you have the general partners, the GPs. These are the guys who do everything. They find the deal. They build the relationships with the brokers. They find the lending broker. They manage the developer or whatever. Right. They do everything. The limited partners are the ones who sit and coach. They pay their their uh, their ticket price and they go to sleep and they cash their checks. <laughs> yeah. Um, then the, then actually kind of like it takes a step forward, especially when you know like if the plane goes down, everybody dies, GPs and LPs. But so <laughs> it, it's held together by a SEC doc. You know you gotta you gotta go to the SEC. It's a Reg D fi- filing, and um you know, it's a 150 page private placement memorandum, but it basically um, aligns the general partners and limited partners. And it's a pretty nice arrangement. Um, sounds all fine and dandy, but the problem is to find a syndicator is a lot of work. Um, these are the country club deals. And if you're, you don't have the network, you're not going to find yourself in any of these deals and being offered to join. So how do you find them? So I paid a lot of money to get in, a bunch of country clubs and that was how like actual I country clubs well there's no country clubs anymore right nobody plays <laughs> golf but the same you know it's sort of like a closed group of high net worth individuals doing deal these type of deals together yeah so where do you where do you go to find to get kind of connected to some of them or get into their network or how did you go about that so there are a lot of um apartment groups out there you just have to sort of just google them and then you can you know those probably won't be the ones you want to join, but if you kind of keep pushing forward. And I always tell people along the journey, you have to be picking up allies, which are other passive investors. You don't, you know, don't have a dog in a fight and you can build real relationships and start, you know, sharing who you're working with and your track records and what some feedback on operators. So yeah. it, it's, it's not like you go, there's no database, there's no website. Um, that would be sort of illegal in a way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but SEC rules, you know, you can't really market any of that kind of stuff. It's all private networks. So you just yeah. have to find rich people who are in these deals. And that's, that's kind I had of a, the game. I mean, but, I had a dude, he asked me one time, I was on the same subject. He's like, Hey, how do I find the guys to kind of, you know, help get in, involved in these deals? And I was like, or I was like, this is gold, man. Here's what you do. You're going to go, you're going to go on Facebook. You can find like an apartment association, a local RIA or whatever, you know, that might be a spot where you're going to have some people in there. When you get to those meetings, find the alpha. Once you find the alpha, go to that guy, (laughs) figure out where he goes, go to the next meeting, find the next alpha. That person probably has a shitload of money and they're probably doing deals like that. We're talking about. (laughs) It's just like, he's like writing this down. He's like, find alpha. Got it. (laughs) (laughs) That's that definitely is a method. Um, you know, they say, well, real estate investing, go to your local RIA. I've actually found that that's the worst place to find other high net worth passive investors. Um, usually yeah. real estate clubs are just attracting broke people. And, you know, these aren't, I mean, you can have an alpha of broke people, but the alpha is not. <laughs> I know? was thinking you just leapfrog it, right? You go to the alpha and then go to the next alpha and the next club and the next one. And eventually you're in the freaking country club. Yeah. I mean, it's not a, it's not a bad way of doing it. Um, or you could just make a podcast and they all come to you. So, you know, yeah, sometimes. that's sh- that's my secret, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just do it a hundred times and then people will start coming. Yeah, that's great. That's um, that's great advice though for people too. It's like, I mean, what's in it for like a, in a syndication kind of deal like that is yeah, your GP. Look, most of the time they don't have to put as much money into it, but they're doing all the work, so they're getting the sweat equity out of it. And then your LPs, your limited partners, they're the ones that are. What's in it for them is they give you the money, but they don't do any of the work. So it's kind of like, you know, there are two options for you guys. If you have no freaking money and you want to get into this space, you well, first of all, get some experience, learn how to do this. And then you can maybe even start your own development deal. Um, and you can go find some of these and broker and network with investors to give you money. The problem is early on, you might not have a lot of trust with people, but you know, building up that trust and building up that network is you got to start somewhere. So you just kind of dive right in. But Right, right. But yeah, let's keep rolling, man. This is great. So that's uh, so you, now you're in these LP deals and you're starting to just throw money and stuff and it's just, it's, it's growing, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, like last year I sold seven of my 11 rentals this year, I'm trying to unload the last four. Um, so I'm just transitioning to be more of a passive investor. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, a lot of people will say, well, Hey, I want to just copy what you're doing, but it's all part of the journey. I mean, if you're, 
net worth is under five hundred thousand dollars, you have, in my opinion, you have no business being in a syndication. Yeah, you know most high net worth accredited investors they only put in five percent of their net worth into any one deal. So they're in dozens and dozens of these things, and they do that because they want to diversify their risk. Um, non-accredited investors, 50, 50 grand is typically the minimum investment to get in these type of deals. You can find $25,000 minimum investment deals, but in my opinion, it's for, from inexperienced syndicators. And I don't think those deals are very good. Um, but you know, if you're thinking 50 grand, um, you know, for a lot of people, that's a big part of your net worth. And yeah. any syndicator who's responsible would not accept you as an investor. Yeah. Unless they're desperate. Yeah, yeah, or your friends or some shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's good advice for people too. So they don't just, you know, hey, I want to get into real estate. How do I just jump into some kind of syndication? That's great. Right. Like, I, I think the problem is like, you know, there's so many podcasts, so many people teaching this stuff that there's so many like, you know, there's there's some kind of obvious breadcrumbs these marketers will put out there. Like, oh yeah, it's multifamily, it's multiple roofs. You, know, you have to just rely on one tenant, which is all true, but it comes down to your net worth. How much money do you have? That really dictates where you start in the game. If you're under a hundred grand, yeah, you got to pick up some single family homes. You might even have to wholesale or sell drugs. You got to make money, right? This is real estate investing. You need money to invest. If you don't have money, you got a money problem and you got to go make some money. Right. I think that's what the, what's great about what you're teaching people is like, I don't know how many times dudes come up to me and they're like, Hey, how do I get involved in real estate or whatever? But they're, they're really broke. I mean, they work, they work month paycheck to paycheck, some kind of monthly job. It's usually low paying hourly bartending, something like that, you know, waiting tables or how do I get into real estate investing? And in that case, you know, I have no problem with someone going to a RIA, learning how to, you know, pick up a flip, saving up 30 grand in cash and then go and buy something cash, try to flip it or try to wholesale. That's fine. But the fact of the matter is what you're teaching is like, look, if you want to play with the big boys or you want to play with the big girls, like you got to freaking get in here and create some kind of cash flow machine. So this is good if you guys are going to college and you're getting a degree in something worthwhile, there's ways that you can do this. Like you don't need to just quit your job and go into real estate full time. In fact, it should be the opposite. Real estate is kind of designed to be a more passive solution in this game. Right. I mean, real estate is the end game solution. I mean, a lot of my investors, they, they've done something like a computer startup or other, um, you know, they've been working in corporate America for a couple dozen decades. You know, real estate is probably the best risk adjusted returns. But if you're trying to make a whole bunch of money in a short period of time, this isn't it. You know, there's right. a whole bunch of other ways to do it. Yeah. That's a great point. And yeah, you can buy deals though. Like when you guys, you know, the banks and underwriters are very intelligent people. You know, a lot of times, especially if you're getting like a conforming loan, which is where there's like a set standards of what the underwriting process looks like. Um, it can be very strict with what your income debt to income ratio looks like. So you have a very low income and like high student loan debt payments or something, you're not going to get approved for some of these loans. So it's like have, being able to get cash flow is a huge part of this game. Like that's why, you know, my buddy can go buy a fourth, a $400,000 unit in an afternoon at a sheriff's sale. And then he can turn that thing around for a million. It's because he got approved to buy that. He didn't buy that cash. He, he had to go through a bank and an underwriting process, but he has a nice income. So it's like, these things are good, but you want to start looking about your, your income and then diversifying your streams of income, you know, and that's one of these things real estate can do that. Right. So, and, and I always say like the single family home rental, that's pretty much the prerequisite to everything else. Like, don't come talk to me about an eightplex or this thing or, or that thing or apartment building. Just go out and one, do one property first because you're likely going to screw it up. So your, your mistakes <laughs> will be a lot less magnified when you do it on a single family home. I mean, that's why I think like, you know, like a turnkey is a great way to get started because you get this thing freshly rehabbed and sometimes you can even own it with a tenant already in place. So you don't need to go to the tenant um, process. Yeah. I, mean, I usually recommend like what I would do if I started over is I'd, I'd probably buy like a duplex and live in one side of it. And then you got your, you know, the advantage is the tenants next door to you. So you can bother them or, or get their rent and stuff. But the disadvantage is the tenants next door to you. So they're going to be bothering you too all the time and it won't seem as passive, but then you can start to figure out if you want to be that hands-on 
landlord, which I quickly found out I don't want to be because I was unclogging a sink at one o'clock in the afternoon for some lady. And, you know, very quickly tenants were calling me thinking it was a hotel, like, Hey, can I have fresh towels on my doorstep? I need to have the door stopper put back on, change a light bulb. I'm like, dude, I'm not going to do that. Right. And I'm also too, like, I'm the friendly guy, you know, I'm, I don't want to be the mean guy that has to go, Hey, you didn't pay your rent. And he's like, you know, I have a lot of problems. I got a lot of personal stuff going on. I'm too compassionate to be like, yeah, I'd be like, I agree that probably you probably shouldn't pay rent. Like, I mean, that's just like, I don't have that personality. So I need a kind of a dick as a property manager to be in there and bulldog through stuff. Yeah. I, I think like, you know, I like for some people, the house hacking thing works, but you know, I, I, the first step I tell people is like, where do you live? If you live in a primary market like Seattle, San Francisco, any part of California, like Boston, New York, Hawaii, you know, you're in a primary market where the rent to value ratios for B and C class property are not going to work, period. Um, you need to look into a secondary market like a Birmingham, Atlanta, Indianapolis, Kansas City, Memphis, to name a few. Um, if you're in a prime market, you know, I think a lot of people who are too afraid to invest not where they live will then do that house hacking thing like how you mentioned. Yeah. But I'm a strong proponent of living where you want, but invest where the numbers make sense, which is not in a primary market. And for most most of us with higher paid salaries, it's, you know, not where we live. Yeah. That's not bad advice. Um, I think I'm kind of in that position where I have a, you know, pretty high paying income, but then there's a a very inexpensive market around me, which makes it nice. Like I can buy lakefront property and within a couple miles, I can buy farmland within a couple miles. I can buy some urban development project. I mean, it's kind of a unique area, which is why my original real estate mentors like, look, I've looked all over the East coast, West coast, South, everything. And this area of Wisconsin is just a unique spot to invest. So it's like, you can kind of get in the game a little bit, but I, that's not bad advice for people. Like, yeah, yeah if you're working in a city or an urban environment, it might not make sense to buy there. It would make sense to look at the places like where I live that would be a good deal, you know? Yeah, I think, yeah, you, you, you hit it right on the head. Where you're at, that makes total sense to house hack and do it there locally. But most of my guys are in like San Francisco, Seattle, sure. on the West Coast, these high price areas. And I always have to like have this like coming to Jesus talk with them, like, no, dude, you're just being a weenie. You don't want to go outside of your comfort zone or outside of the state and um, they don't house hack because the properties where they live, I mean, they're going to need like $100,000 down payment to yeah. even purchase that property and they're not going to cash flow. The rent to values are not going to work. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's pretty good advice. So tell me, um, what does somebody do... So let's say someone wants to get involved with a, they don't have a lot of money to start and they have a, a lower income. What would you recommend a solution to what they should do? I don't know, man. I'm not that guy. <laughs> I had a, I don't know. Like, okay. So I'm just shooting from the hip here. I mean, you got to save money. You're a problem solver. You can do this, right? Yeah. I mean, I guess it's about like, I always ask people like, you know, how much money can you save at the end of the year? Right. And that okay. really tell, dictates the strategy. I mean, I have a guy who's making like 250, 300 grand in the Bay Area and they're only able to save 10 grand. You know, that, I mean, that's kind of just a rounding area. I don't Jeez. know how that happens, but actually, a lot of people are kind of like that. But let's just say you're able to save $10,000. Now, down payment on one of these $100,000 houses will run you probably about 25 grand. Mm -hmm. So now just do the math. It's going to take you two and a half years to grind and save. $25,000. But when you do, you know, you'll be able to save a few, another few hundred, few thousand dollars on top of that. So the next one should come a little bit quicker and the next one should come a little bit quicker. Yeah. So, I mean, after that, like how you said, you can only save yourself too much. You might, I mean, you might have to make more money. I mean, if you're making 30 grand a year, it's like, dude, like apply yourself and try and make more money. Now, I don't want to sound like a dick, you know, some people don't have college <laughs> educations and it's hard to find jobs, but like, I don't know, you might want to go back to college. I don't know. You know, I, like, I just don't think there is an excuse though, dude. Like I was looking on LinkedIn the other day and I see this ad for a UPS handler, package handler. It's four and a half hours a week and it's from like four in the morning until like nine or something like that. And it's 25 or $26 an hour. 
So you're looking right there at $50 or $50,000 a year if you've got that full time, but at least an, an additional $25,000 you can make a year to whatever your job is because your job probably doesn't even start until nine. So it's yeah. like, there's so many things like, like the market is just on fire right now. Like go find something or create a small business. Like we're talking about cash flow here. Like you got to get cash flow up, get your income higher, and then you can start going into these pla- these spaces in real estate and really doing some damage. Um, and yeah, your, your strategy is just talking to those people that are looking at how do I get my income higher? Like I have a good income or I have a job. I'm a W2 employee. Let's, let's go a different route. Cause you're going to get that same cookie cutter crap. Like what you were talking about before. It's just like, yeah, just put, you know, 10% in your pension, put 15% in your 401k or whatever it is. Right. And then you're going to get all this crap. When in reality, it's like, dude, if all you need is $25,000 and you can start getting in the game with real estate. So a lot of people have that, you know? Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, I'm not one of those educators that tells you to go into this program for $20,000 when you got to call your credit card company to $5,000. You know, I'm a very against that. Um, yeah. And I get really frustrated when, like you said, like people just don't get their shit done. Right. Like they just can't, yeah. they're just unwilling to do that. Like, so maybe I've, 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 you know, kind of been pulled to working with more high net worth people with good paying jobs because I like working with those type of people. They seem to be, pretty frugal for the most part. Um, they're just misled by all that financial certified financial planner garbage. Yeah. And don't buy life insurance as a way to get rich people. Jeez. <laughs> if I have to freaking go on that rant again, like, Oh yeah, we got this like whole life life insurance policy where you can put it all in a savings account that makes 4%. And like, why would you do that? Go buy real estate. Like stop fucking around. You know? <laughs> it's yeah. Just like- yeah. I mean, most times that stuff is a scam. But I mean, in certain situations, you know, the wealthy will use that sort of an infinite banking concept. But yeah, I mean, if you're under net worth $500,000, you shouldn't be touching that stuff. Right. Yeah, this is great stuff, man. So what else? So, okay, so someone's got a job, they get out of school, they're a professional. And when I say professional, I mean, a lot of things can be a professional, but if you're in the military, engineer, nursing, medical, you know, you're in an industry that's got kind of high paying tags behind it, which a lot of people who listen to this do, a lot of them are military investors, you know. Um, what, what's kind of the next steps? So you say buy, buy some single families or get started with at least a single family or something like that. That's what you tell them. Yeah, yeah. Go buy a single family home. I would say if you're making more than like $100,000 a year, I would recommend especially single family homes because you're, you're kind of on that higher paid professional band and you're going to graduate to limited partner syndication sooner. And, you know, like for take myself example, I had 11 of these single family homes. Should I have like done it a little slower? I would only gotten four. Yeah. And the resale of single family homes are a lot better than a duplex, triplex, or quad. The the two the duplex, triplex, or quad might have will likely have better cash flow numbers, you know, rent to value ratios, but the exit strategy on those are horrible. Like the only people you can sell that to is another cheap skate investor. Mm-hmm. What you want is that you know, single family home that you kind of hold on to for a little bit, then you sell to that emotional buyer and you get that little nice little pop. Got it. Okay. So you're, you're saying the advantage of basically a single family is it, this, the resale is a little bit easier. So it's a more flexible option. It's a little bit more liquid than buying a bunch of multifamilies per se. Right. And that's again, for the higher paid professional, probably making over a hundred thousand dollars because they will transition to being an LP in a larger, much larger deals soon. Yeah. So you want to be able to get out of your single families and dump more into LPs. Right. But you know, it, it's kind of unfortunate for the lower paying guy. It's just going to be a longer grind and you might as well just um, pick up more cash flow to get yourself there quicker. I got you. So you're basically, you're, so the, the overall strategy you're kind of recommending is try to pick up, you know, some single families until you get to a position where your net worth is at a point where you can start getting into some of these truly passive LP deals. And the way you find these LP deals is you network with high net worth individuals and try to kind of get in their inner circle a little bit so you can start dumping money into it. Right. And high net worth people who are sophisticated investors, they don't want to talk to a newbie. You got to go pick up some rentals of your own and, you know, get some stripes on your, on your sleeve a little bit. Yeah. I agree with that. You know, if you can talk their language too, they'll welcome you in a lot faster than if it's, it's a lot of work to kind of mentor people, which is what I found out getting involved in real estate, which is why I decided to start selling coaching was just because, you know, you spend so much time and energy talking to people about it that, 
it's like, I, you know, I, if I would have just had this knowledge, here's what I would have paid. So you can sign up with me for coaching and I can give you whatever I can on the podcast. You got free good shit right here, but yeah. after a while it just becomes kind of exhausting. Yeah. I mean, that's why I made my podcast. Cause like I got so tired of every, all my buddies asking me, well, how'd you buy this rental property? Like 2000 miles away you know, and then nobody does anything. Right. <laughs> Cause you're in Hawaii right now. And are you in Hawaii or are you in Seattle? Yeah, I'm in Hawaii. I'm in Hawaii. I moved to Hawaii a couple of years ago. Yeah. And you got properties all in the you know lower 48. Yeah. So that's a, just a, a story in itself right there. It's like, yeah, I can manage this stuff all over the world because I've set up systems and have a connection of people that help me work with that. Right. Right. So how do you vet your property managers? So they're all by referral. Okay. Um, you know, you don't work, one of the biggest mistakes is you don't want you working with uh, these these agents or property managers from like these bigger firms like i don't know if you can see them but like century 21 or keller williams or these bigger firms because yeah. you're getting the dude who can't sell houses you, know, yeah. you don't want, you don't want him he's not going to be the first one who's going to lay down the law and be a good project manager for you you know he just barely can get his own crap done <laughs> yeah I, I made the mistake of getting a property management service that owned us a, a significant share of units in the same area that he was managing mine or the company was managing mine. So it's like inherently there's a conflict of interest that we started to find out was like, they're going to want to fill their units faster than they fill your units. So oh, it's like, I see. but yeah, I think that's a good point. Like, you know, so we moved over to a guy that just has exclusive, he's a, just a property manager. There's no more, he doesn't have any ownership. So it's kind of all equally weighted. Yeah. But, yeah. I mean, that's the golden rule. Go off referrals of other passive investors. And then just kind of dovetails in what I said earlier, find other passive investors. I mean, I've got a list of like 25 questions you can use to interview property managers. But as I, as I, you know, put in there in disclaimer, don't be with that guy who just goes like a robot and just asks all these questions. Um, <laughs> you're going to repel good property managers. The good property managers don't want to work with people like, you know, you, if you're going to do that. Right. Yeah. Start to be, they're going to start to botch questions because they want, don't want you as a client. Yeah. A lot of times they just want to just manage your property and they don't want you to, which is nice because I want you to manage my property. I don't want to. <laughs> right. Right. Okay. So the, there's really no excuse for not having information on this stuff. You've got just tons of content and great stuff all over your website. Um, what are some good resources that you can provide people so they can learn a little bit more in detail about the stuff we discussed here? Yeah, I would say like, you know, if you're trying to pick up single family home rentals, my first 20 podcasts are kind of the toolbox for that. And your um, podcast is on your website or how can they find that? Yeah, simple passive cash flow. They just Google that or put it into iTunes or Google Play. Okay. Uh, that's usually what I, I tell most people is like, hey man, go listen to these first 20. It's kind of the foundational stuff. Um, and then, you know, just put it into practice. And, you know, I'm always kind of looking to help other people get started, whether it's a referral to a lender or you know a turnkey provider but i do like i do ask people take a listen to the first 20 podcasts because you know like lately i've had people like my my people who i work with and would refer people to they'd be like yeah these guys are idiots like it's just another guy who's like kicking tires like can you at least bet them a little bit better you know i'm like yeah yeah no i got you <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah i'm with you dude um where else can they find, uh, you know, connect with you or, or work with you a little bit closer or find more content that you have too? Yeah. I mean, it's all on my website, simplepassivecashflow.com. Um, we'll have all this in the show notes too, but if you guys want to hear it. Yeah. My email is lane at simplepassivecashflow.com. But again, yeah, check out the podcast first and then we can have a more educated conversation. Yeah. Lay the groundwork at the foundation. That's great. That's yeah. a great rule of thumb. I think I might adopt that one. Yeah. Just like, like if you can't listen to 20 podcasts, man, like you're not going to, take these other steps to actually do anything and you're just wasting your time. Yeah. And a little yeah. bit of mine. Yeah. <laughs> and, and as we've established today, time's a little bit, one of your uh, more valuable characteristics here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I mean, if I could help out like that one guy who's like working his butt off at home and then, you know, help him down the path to pick up a few rentals. And then now, now like him or the wife, can stay at home with the young kids, you know, that's, that's what it's all about, right? This yeah. stuff unlocks a whole bunch of, I mean, money isn't everything, but it sure makes life a lot easier. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Trust me. So tell me what, if, if you could just summarize one real quick piece of advice you would give to somebody, um, kind of just starting out in the game, what would it be? 
Um, I think it goes back to the self-awareness, like figure out what you, what resources you have in terms of time, money, and knowledge. Obviously you're not gonna have too much knowledge, but in terms of time and money, you know, if you don't have money, you got to go make money. You may have to wholesale and do all this other stuff. My podcast, my platform is not that, that, you know, I help people who are higher net worth with good paying salaries, take it to the next level. Mm -hmm. Um, so that that's the first node you get to figure out where you're at. If you don't have time and you don't have money, I'm sorry, dude, like you're SOL, (laughs) you know, like, and if you're like the guy who doesn't make too much money and unwilling to take that UPS job that you mentioned, like, I'm sorry, like, like, look, you're just going to be stuck with where you're at. And then you have to ask yourself the question, if the status quo is what you're at and are you okay doing that for the next 20, 40, 60, hundred years? Yeah. That's a serious question to ask yourself too, you know? Like look at what you could have been or what you're willing to sacrifice over the, over time because that's all we've got. But I mean, to your point, you don't have money, you don't have time. Well, you might have energy. You might be able to do something. Like put put your energy and focus into in one thing with intensity, and you'd be surprised at how far that can go as far as cash flow. Right. right. Yeah. So what last question I got for you is just what kind of books um, or book would you recommend somebody to read to get to get in the game a little bit? I, I'm not a big fan of books um okay. i've got like a list on my website simple passive slash books of like four books that i would recommend but one of them is uh the real estate uh millionaire real estate investor there's a lot of fundamentals that i think most people should know before they get started but i, I think most people read too much damn books yeah like they're not talking to people they're not getting um property sent to them they're not analyzing in the spreadsheet so you're saying getting into action over just studying would probably yeah. be a little more helpful. Yeah. And, you know, even like put down the podcast, you know, too. I mean, once you've been listening to podcasts for six months, it's like, dude, like you're not taking action. Yeah. Paralysis by analysis, right? People just right. like, oh, is this a good deal? Is this a good deal? I always tell people a good deal is better than a great deal because a good deal, at least you're like taking action on a great deal you'll never find. Right, yeah. right. And, and that's you know, another reason why like a turnkey rental is so nice because you can't really screw that thing up. It's yeah. hard to, I mean, you get unlucky, yeah. but yeah. Awesome. Hey man, this was, this was great advice today. Is there anything else you want to share or anything else you got going on that you'd like to promote? Um, no, I mean, I got my, my mastermind group for um, mostly accredited investors, but okay. um, yeah, maybe if your folks are interested in that simple com slash journey. Okay. So if you're an accredited investor out there, you can go simplepassivecashflow.com slash journey. Yeah. Awesome, man. Well, hey, dude, this was a great conversation. Thanks so much. I, I, I think the listeners are going to love it. You know, we, we got a lot of details out there. That was just a question I kept getting. People are like, hey, I got a good job. What's a good side hustle? And I think that that's, that's what we touched on today. Yeah, so yeah. I'm, a, I'm a big fan of the side hustle. I mean, I just quit my job like five months ago. Yeah. I think I think all too often people are like, they get this entrepreneur buzz and they're like, screw it. I'm going to quit my job, you know, without any proof of concept. Yeah. Because it's sort of like an ego thing. Yeah. Like, yeah, I quit my job, you know, but they had no success. They weren't creating, you know, you want to have a side, a side gig because it's hard and your resources are constrained and that way you build the right system so that when you do leave your day job, now you're, now you're kind of going a thousand miles an hour. That was, that's really good advice. And I really, that's, I want to emphasize that for just a second too, because the thing about what a side income does is it's like, let's say you don't have as, you know, you won't have as much time to put into it because you're working a full-time job, which forces you to compress everything into like systems. And those systems someday when you become the CEO, you'll have a system for this company that you decide to start. And then you'll have time to analyze the strategy and the planning aspect of it. Right. So it's like, that was a really good emphasis. Cause yeah, if you're like, Oh, I got to quit my job so I can go, I'm going to quit my job for $80,000 a year to go make $30,000 a year. It's like, no, how do you make $80,000 a year on your side job and just compress the time down? Because then when you jump into it, you're going to have maybe even more because you've already figured out a way of focusing your cash flow. Yeah. You've done something to create cash flow. Exactly. I mean, I, I think you see a lot of these guys who like read a lot of biographies and I, I personally think it's a little, geeky but like you know people get this self-selecting bias right they see what all these like successful people have done which is typically take this great leap of faith and become an entrepreneur and do it right 10 exit but they don't see the thousands and thousands of other people who have failed doing that yeah 
Yeah, it's a good point. You know, and you know, if, if you're ready to, if you're in a position with your emotional and spiritual journey to where you feel that you're truly connected to take that leap of faith, I think that's fine. But if you're doing it from your point as an ego perspective, and that's what I think a lot of people are doing this, it's like, I'm going to be an entrepreneur to say I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a full-time entrepreneur. It's just like, if you're just doing it to say that, then you're really seeking validation from other people. And you're telling me that that's not connected to your heart and your soul, you know, and I'm big on that kind of stuff. It's like, it's got to come from the right place. So good for emphasizing that too. And we could clarify that for people because it's like, sometimes it is a seamless transition out of entre into entrepreneurship. Yeah. And at least in your case, it was. Yeah. I mean, it's 2019, right? Entrepreneur means no job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there, there's, there's definitely better ways of, of going about this. And I think that's a good, good thing to emphasize. Well, cool, man. Well, guys, you know, once again, it was, uh, you got to say, I, I keep pronouncing your last name wrong. So you got to hit me with this. It's, it's Lane Kawoka. Yeah. Kawoka. You got it right. Yeah. You yeah. got it right, man. Good, man. That's awesome. This is what I needed. I needed that validation. That's what we're talking about. <laughs> no, cool, man. Yeah, you guys know too that we are putting on a, an event. It's going to be on the island of St. Lucia. It's a retreat called Personal Growth Ventures. And if you guys are interested, if you're just, it's, it's really for those kind of early phase entrepreneurs, people looking to build their, build their business, start a business, or really take it to the next level in their life and their personal journey. You can go to personalgrowthventures.com. It's an island retreat going on May of 2020. So we're taking, uh, we're taking signups right now after that, guys. You know, when they fill up, it's, it's going to fill up. So we want to make sure we're getting everybody an opportunity to get in there and especially the listeners of this show. So once again, personalgrowthventures.com. And I am your host, guys. Thanks. Let's uh, thank, give Lane a, a round of applause wherever you're at. You know, we'll just maybe put in some music or something of applause here for, for what an awesome show today. That was, uh, we really appreciated that, brother. And uh, with that said, guys, Winners Waltz, World Views. You can find more about me at AaronJArmstrong.com. And you can listen to this podcast, AaronJArmstrong.com slash podcast. Once again, thanks, guys. What's up, everybody? This is your host, AJ Armstrong. You can follow me on Instagram at AaronArmstrong33. That's AaronArmstrong33. Or you can go to my website, AaronJArmstrong.com. Thanks so much for listening through to the end. I wanted to also introduce you guys to our Facebook community. So you can go to Winners Vaults World Views on Facebook. And it's a group where we can offer, you know, different opportunities for you guys to ask questions. If you have a Q&A or something in your business or a challenge in your life that you want to bring up, that's the community to ask it. And then I can also share that with all of our listeners on our, or on our social media platforms. The final thing I wanted to share with you guys is something that Marissa and I have been so excited for. It's been really chomping at me to freaking tell you guys. And it's our Personal Growth Ventures Retreat. So our Personal Growth Ventures Retreat is going to be located on the island of St. Lucia. It's going to be a business seminar combined with personal growth and development. And we're also adding in something nobody else has ever done in a seminar that I have heard of. And that's fitness and adventure. So these are the things that are going to help push us to our limits. It's going to help us break through our fears. And these adventures are going to be one of a kind. If you want to find out more about what our adventures entail what's going to be involved in the education session and where this is all going to be happening and when you can go to our website, personalgrowthventures.com. That's personalgrowthventures.com. It's also going to be located in the show notes. So with that said, guys, thanks so much for listening through to the end. Once again, go be somebody.